Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is Force with nine important tips for getting started in ESO. I frequently get a lot of different questions and I thought it'd make sense to consolidate the answers to all of those and get you guys off on the right path as you start your adventures in Tamriel. Let's go ahead and get things started with tip number one, your class does not dictate your role. It is very important to keep in mind with this game that preconceived notions of what the classes should do aren't necessarily exactly what they have to do. The Dragonite doesn't need to be a tank, the Sorcerer doesn't need to be a caster, the Templar doesn't need to be a healer, and the Nightblade doesn't need to be a rogue. While they can all certainly fill those roles, some of the best and most optimal builds don't fit into that mold. For example, a Dragonite makes an amazing mage, a Sorcerer can make a great tank, and the Nightblade can make a fantastic healer. These are just some small examples of the different options because the skill system in this game allows you to use any of the weapons and thusly get access to any of the weapon skills skills, as well as using any type of armor, lots of options are available. Tip number two, skills scale with more of the attribute that they cost. All class skills in this game, no matter the class that you are, cost Magicka. Other skills that cost Magicka include the Destruction Staff and Restoration Staff skill lines. All of those skills, their damage and effectiveness, the white numbers that you see in the text, that will scale up with the more Magicka that you have. Whereas the weapon skills, including the two-handed, dual-wielding, one-handed shield, and bow, those all cost stamina and as such scale with the more stamina that you have. So when deciding whether whether or not you should be investing in more magic or stamina, just look at the skills that you're using, and the more you're using of a skill that costs one resource or the other, that is what you should focus on leveling up, putting more points into, because that's going to mean more damage, longer duration, and overall more effectiveness. Tip number three is to give yourself options. When you are leveling up, the best way to level your skills is by using them and having them on your bar while you're turning in quest. So while you are going through this leveling process, it is very wise to diversify your skill sets. Take skills from multiple different skill lines so you can level those up and have many options once you reach endgame. The same thing applies for your armor. I highly suggest taking five of one type of armor, depending on whether or not you are a Magicka focused, tank focused, or stamina focused, go five light, medium, or heavy, and then in the last two slots, use one of each of the other. That way you will be leveling up all three of the skill lines for armor, and you will have options if you ever decide to switch your role, as these will already be leveled up. Tip number four is to get started on your desired crafting profession as soon as possible. There's various things that you can do. I personally would try to pick the crafting profession that allows you to create, create the most pieces for your character. Specifically, if you anticipate that you'll be using light armor, you probably want to go clothing because that allows you to essentially make seven pieces, whereas if you wanted to make yourself some staffs, that would only be one piece if you selected woodworking. So if you will focus on any, focus on one that will probably give you the most value and then with that said get started early you like to start investing skill points specifically the hirelings that will get you resources on a daily basis and then also the ability to more readily deconstruct and get resources of your desired crafting profession always 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 have research going in all of the crafting professions woodworking blacksmithing as well as clothing because these will come in handy if you ever decide to pick one of those up later down the road Tip number five is to know what you're looking at. We're going to do a quick overview of the different icons on the map and what they mean. The sword icon is for the Fighter's Guild. This symbol is for the Mage's Guild. Whenever you see these scales, that is typically a marketplace which will indicate uh, various types of vendors at that location, sometimes crafting stations, such as you can see the woodworking station here. And then when you see the crafting station symbols next to a person's name, that means there's a vendor for that type of station that's available there. That little bag symbol that you see at the bottom bottom here of this list that is for a bag vendor where you can purchase more inventory space uh, whenever you see this blacksmithing table this little forge thing with a fire behind it that typically means something crafting related will there it will be there as you can see here we've got the blacksmithing station as well as the clothing station the little treasure chest symbol is a bank icon so you can typically find a bank vendor there uh, the tavern mug will indicate a tavern typically food and drink vendors are there as well as a cooking fire and then, of course, for the horse, that will be the stable, and that was going to be where you purchase your horse, as well as upgrade it every 20 hours. 
In terms of the general zone map, a couple things to keep in mind. These torches that you come across will be dungeons, public dungeons to be exact, and then the torches with a plus sign, which I can show you, for example, right over here, those are the group dungeons which require a, uh, a team of four people to go into. Uh, any of the eye locations, those are points of interest. Sometimes there will be crafting stations there. The crafting station specific icons are these ones down here with the hammer and nail crossing as well as a fire behind it. Of of course, we've got the way shrine symbols. Uh, we also have just general general symbols that indicate there's some questing that needs to be done here. Uh, the castle, this little archway, the dilapidated tower, the tree, all of these symbols here. This is just a questing area, and you're going to be able to find quests there and complete objectives. Uh, the little swirly symbol indicates a dark anchor, which is a mini event. And then the skull and crossbone symbol, those are for the outdoor world bosses. Tip number six is to pick the right mount for you. So if you didn't purchase the Imperial Edition, you won't have access to the Imperial Horse, which costs one gold, and of course you'll be able to get that right away. The first horse you'll be able to afford is the Common Horse, which costs 17,000 gold, and will typically be available to you sometime around level 20. That's the average time in which you will have saved up enough gold to afford that. However, it is very important to keep in mind that this horse, starting off at level one, like all the other horses, has a base speed at 15%, whereas the light horse, one of the 42,000 gold horses, starts off at 25% at level 1. Basically, in this game, you're able to level the horses from 1 to 50. Each level, you decide if you want to increase its speed, increase its stamina, or increase its carrying capacity. This is important because the light horse has the potential to be the fastest horse in the game by 10%. If you focused on leveling speed for any of these horses, it would only go up from that 15 15% to that level 50 mark, whereas the light horse, as you can see, starting off at 25% at level 1, will eventually, if capping the speed, be 10% faster than any of the other horses. So it might be wise to skip the 17,000 gold horse available to you around level 20 typically and save up for the 42,000 gold horse, which you should be able to afford around level 30. Tip number seven is to not be afraid to try different things. The reason is because skill resets are an option in this game. Every single alliance has one of these locations, which include a Shrine of Oriel, as well as a Shrine of Stendar. At these shrines, you're able to not only respec your attribute points, but you can also respec your skill points. So that means trying different things is just fine. Now the respec cost is basically just based on the number of points you've invested. It is 100 gold per skill point, as well as 100 gold per attribute point. The location of these shrines, for the Aldmeri Dominion, you will find this in Elden Root, which is located in Grotwood. For the Ebon Heart Pact, you will find the reset location over here in Mornhold, which is located in Deshaun. And then finally, for the Daggerfall Covenant, you will find this in Wayrest, which is located in Stormhaven. Tip number eight is emptying your bags, or more specifically, getting a good routine for when you go to town. Every time you visit town to empty your bags, there's a few things you want to make sure you do. Number one, of course, is check your inventory to see if any of the gear in there you're able to use and that you want to use. The second thing you should do is make sure you've got researching going in woodworking, clothing, as well as blacksmithing. You always want to make sure these researchers are going. You want to start doing this as soon as possible because of the extended amount of time that it takes to get these things done. Once you have done those two things, if there's any crafting professions you are focusing on leveling up, you want to make sure you deconstruct for those professions. And then the rest of the stuff, if you're looking to save up gold, you should sell it to vendors. Or if you're looking to just improve all your crafting, you should break down uh, anything that's pertaining to any of the other crafting professions. And then lastly, once you have done all of that, put everything that's excess into your bank. This is typically for me going to include any of the crafting specific specific stuff that I want to hold on to. And the ninth and final tip for today is to set yourself up for success 
if you want to play that way. I'm specifically talking about the different game options and settings. So let's just go ahead and quickly go through some of these things. None, none, none of the gr graphical quality really matters that much. Uh, gameplay wise, I do highly suggest putting on auto loot if you want to speed up the process of looting things. Uh, it's also not a bad idea to turn off double tap to dodge and rebind it to an ability. Myself in particular, I have got that rebound to one of my mouse buttons. You can do it to anything though. The double tap to dodge can be a little finicky. Binding it to just a single key press can make that a little more reliable. In terms of the interface, getting that information that you want, I have action bar to always show so that I will always know when my ultimate is available. A quest tracker on, you know, that's, that's fine if you want to keep track of things. Health bars I find pretty important in games like these. I specifically make sure that I always have on, not just injured, for friendly players, enemy NPCs, and enemy players. Um, that way I, I'm consistently knowing who they are and what they are. The NPCs, not so important if they don't have a health bar. I know it's not one of these three. Uh, same thing for self. It's not super important to have that floating above your head. Uh, down over here, the glow. I mean, obviously, if you want that stuff, it might be immersion breaking for some, uh, but it also makes things much more... Yeah, there's a lot more information for you as the player. I do also have add-ons going specifically right now. I'm just using Loot Drop by Pocket. This makes it so that when I auto loot, any loot that I pick up shows in the bottom right hand corner for a few seconds. And then of course, uh, there are the key bindings if you want to rebind anything. Uh, it's, it's a good idea to d give yourself some different options and put yourself in the most comfortable position for responding very quickly. I mentioned specifically that the the uh, double tap to dodge, I did rebind to my mouse button. I find that to be a very, very responsive uh, way to actually approach that. And it, it's been pretty effective for me personally. And with that, we will be wrapping up this quick guide with nine tips for getting started in ESO. Hopefully this has proved to be beneficial for you guys and informative. Again, I just wanted to answer and get a quick video out there showing off uh, some of the basic questions that I get on a regular basis and providing you guys some concise answers for those. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned in the future for more ESO coverage right here on the channel. Uh, the game has now officially launched. I'm really excited to jump in with the rest of you guys. I'll see you in Tamriel. Keep watching and keep owning.